Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second panel of a Finance Watch webinar entitled Sustainable Corporate Governance, Setting the Incentives and Obligations for Companies to Transition Towards Sustainability. Following an exciting panel discussing corporate sustainability targets, director's duties, and director's remuneration, now we will debate whether there is a need for mandatory rules on corporate due diligence through value chain and whether such rules would create opportunities for businesses. Benefiting from a very rich and a diverse experience of our exquisite panelists, we will debate uh, we will debate whether we need European legislation on corporate due diligence through value chain, how to design an impactful regulation that will effectively hold companies into account, and how to ensure proportionality. We will also discuss what is happening at the global level and reflect on how to create convergence and ensure that laws are sufficiently consistent across different geographies. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce Ms. Heidi Hautala, Vice President of the European Parliament, um, this function she holds since October 2017, and a member of the European Parliament in the Greens European Free Alliance Group. Ms. Hautala is a member of the Committee on International Trade and the Subcommittee on Human Rights. She has been instrumental in advancing a European sustainable agenda and in promoting responsible business conduct. In 2017, she established a working group on responsible business conduct uh, in the European Parliament. More recently, she has been a shadow rapporteur of the European Parliament's own initiative report on due diligence and corporate accountability, and a rapporteur of the committee providing opinion on the own initiative report on sustainable corporate governance. Welcome, Ms. Hautala. We are also joined today by Tyler Gillard, the head of due diligence unit and senior legal advisor in the OECD Center for Responsible Business Conduct. Tyler joined the OECD in 2009 to lead the multi-stakeholder negotiation of the OECD due diligence guidance for responsible supply chains of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. He has since overseen the development of numerous global supply chain standards. Tyler works closely with governments, the private sector and civil society to implement these standards and integrate them into national policies, regulations and industry practice, which makes his experience extremely valuable for our today's discussion. Now, moving on to Anselm Mialon, Deputy Head of the Sustainable Finance, Corporate Law, Accounting and Corporate Governance Unit at the French Treasury. He is in charge of audit and corporate governance matters. He was a rapporteur of a report dealing with purpose-driven companies. Prior to joining the French Treasury, Anselm worked as a lawyer in various international firms, working on both securities regulation and financial matters. Last but certainly not least, I have the pleasure to introduce Andrea Saldariaga, an international lawyer and expert on business and human rights, with nearly 20 years of experience advising businesses, investors, and governments to address how to address strategic and operational social sustainability challenges. She is the founder and principal of SILA Advisory, a mission-driven organization seeking to embed respect for human rights across business activities and public policy. Um, now I will pass on to our esteemed panelists to start with the introductory remarks, um, during which uh, some of the questions I would like them to ask to reflect on is, where are we now? What are your views on the state of play of due diligence today? What are the issues and challenges you see? And are you happy with the trajectory of where we are going? Ms. Hautala, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I had the chance to listen to the second part of your first panel. And I must say that uh, I very much agree with uh, what has been said, for instance, by Olivier Boutelis uh, Taft, that um, um, we are externalizing our uh, cl climate footprint, carbon footprint, and many other impacts, adverse impacts on, on other continents. And the only way uh, to really address these issues is to, to look at how we consume and that we as consumers and citizens 
uh, that we uh, demand um, a level playing field for companies that they will uh, diminish and eradicate all these adverse impacts. And that's why we need to finally to implement the EU, the, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And here, let me let me uh, express my, my great feeling of loss after Professor Raghi left the scene uh, last month. So that was indeed a, a great achievement that, uh, that we have these uh, UN guiding principles that are truly guiding us. So um, I also um, had a chance to, to listen to um, uh, Commissioner Reinders and I'm greatly encouraged because uh, there are quite many rumors here and there about what is to come uh, from the commission in terms of sustainable corporate governance. Um, I paid attention to the fact that um, he said the EC is looking for the civil liability and administrative measures, because indeed there can be no uh, accountability without enforcement of, of the forthcoming rules. And uh, I also believe that he hasn't given up his idea to clarify the duty of directors to better support long-term value creation. And in this light, uh, I would like to say that I was really astonished to see last spring that the um, uh, the, the directors of uh, the five uh, Nordic country business uh, organizations um, uh, wrote a very angry letter to the Financial Times saying that uh, it's unprecedented, it's unforeseen that uh, now the EU would uh, let the NGOs uh, uh, sort of hijack uh, the companies. Of course, this is not what is going to happen. But the question is that now it's time that companies must be invited and uh, obliged to, to study their operating environment, their business environment, and this principle of double materiality that we, we all want to see in the new rules should apply, that the company is observing carefully its own impact on, on its uh, stakeholders and environment, and uh, how the, the operating environment affects the company. So in, indeed, I think we need to also to touch the, um, the uh, corporate governance, and uh, the corporate governance is not a Bible, it's not a Quran or something. It's something that has to live with time. And that's why I very much support also what Beate Schofel said, that the company law should be uh, changed to, to reflect the interest of the company for sustainability within planetary boundaries. And I, I'm, I'm truly humbled to notice that this concept planetary boundaries is becoming almost like an of, a part of our official language also in the EU documents. Now, uh, indeed, um, I think um, a lot has been said about the need of level playing field. And um, we, of course, need to be sure that what the EU is putting in place in the coming months and perhaps year or two uh, is, um, is a step towards global standards. And there, I think Oliver also said something really useful that the EU is still the biggest consumer market. So whatever is going to be put in place here will be sort of radiating and will have a spillover effect uh, far beyond. So let's use this opportunity. Um, so um, I think um, why this all has taken quite long in the Commission is that um, uh, there, there are different uh, instruments on its way. Uh, another thing is that um, reflecting a little bit the EU legislation on, on timber, on, on conflict minerals, on fisher, Ill, illicit, um, unreported fishing, uh, we also might now need an instrument to, to, to prohibit placing um, in our market uh, products which imply um, deforestation. And there's an instrument in this uh, vein coming up. So all this has to be kind of, uh, let's say, um, it has to, to form a, a puzzle that all, where all pieces fit together and that they support each other. And I, I pay attention to what Reinders announced to you today that there will be other accompanying measures um, uh, coming up with the, the sustainable corporate governance legislation. So I, I think uh, maybe I'll leave it to this. I'm very optimistic and I, I realize that the Commission is studying quite carefully what the European Parliament proposed uh, in its resolution on the 10th of March in the Lara Walters report. So I, I'm, I'm confident that it will be a, a, an ambitious legislation that will come to the Member States and to the Parliament to, to decide on. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Hautala, for these very important insights and, and indeed congratulations on, on a very good and ambitious report uh, in the European Parliament. And we do very much hope that, you know, the, 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 the Commission will take a lot of them, of that on board, a lot of these proposals. And um, uh, now I'd like to pass over uh, to Tyler. 
Uh, Tyler, would you like to share your thoughts and also maybe a bit of your experience, you know, uh, working at OECD and maybe sharing with us a little bit, you know, what's happening at the global level? And, you know, like in a way, what is your assessment of what so far has and hasn't worked and what we can learn from that uh, in Europe? It's my pleasure. Thank you very much, um, Alexandra and MEP Haltala for those wonderful remarks as always. Um, well, I would say looking back at the last uh, 10, 15 years when I've been working on due diligence and when these concepts of due diligence were developed to really reflect best practice uh, for what business should do to address human rights, environmental risk, uh, based on, you know, 30 years of social compliance and, and processes that, you know, frankly, you know, help to bring attention to these issues, but haven't really addressed them and made improvements for workers' lives and planet on the ground. We look at, and I think a real mixed picture, you know, on the one hand, we have at the global policy level, real alignment of norms. Um, that is, I mean, I think that cannot be understated how important that is and not easy. You have the concept of due diligence is a thread that runs through both ILO standards for labor rights, obviously, the UN guiding principles um, and the OECD uh, guidelines, which extend that principle also to environmental harms and corruption. Um, so we have an alignment of norms. We have obviously increased investor attention on environmental, social governance and human rights issues with now this year, 45 trillion in assets under management um, uh, that are aligned with or tilted towards ESG. Uh, that's doubled in three years. Um, we see a patchwork already of global norms and policies and laws emerging, both at a sectoral level, particularly for finance in Europe, but also on conflict minerals on timber and in other jurisdictions on issues like modern slavery and climate reporting. Um, and I think we've seen, frankly, that many large businesses and consumer facing businesses have adopted and changed their policies. They've adopted and made commitments to these standards. So that's the good news. I mean, the bad news is that in reality on the ground, you know, workers' lives are not necessarily improving. And I think the COVID crisis has exposed a lot of those vulnerabilities in, in global supply chains um, that are linked to, you know, basically the resilience of everything we do is built on the backs of workers and supply chains. Um, and with something like a unforeseen pandemic hits, we're still feeling supply shocks now, you know, two years later. Um, we are so in that respect, we are really far from this kind of perfect equilibrium of shared value creation where business is, you know, puts as much effort into managing risk to people and planet as they do to their own business. You know, on the company side, um, you know, I think business is really struggling um, and hasn't really shown or proven that they can effectively prevent and address and avoid risks, particularly deep down in the supply chain. I think, you know, uh, like I said, 30 years of social compliance processes has helped business get a good grip on their tier one. But uh, beyond that, when you look at raw materials, when you look at trade through intermediaries and complex trading patterns, um, businesses still haven't really figured out how to uh, identify and then actually address those types of risks that are, are associated with raw materials and how to cooperate with each other and with producing countries and their manufacturers to drive change. Another big challenge that we've seen in the last year, 10 years is financing, where, you know, who is gonna finance the improvement we see in supply chains? How is that cost gonna be allocated? Is that gonna be the consumer? Is that gonna be the buyer in Europe that somehow purchases responsibly? But that makes sense in a sort of business to business relationship. But when we go to raw materials and six tiers up the supply chain, responsible purchasing practices may not be the answer. You know, we need to think of financial instruments to finance improvements in factories and paying a living wage. And due diligence in that sense, I would say is not the silver bullet. It's necessary, but not sufficient to really drive improvement in global supply chains. And we do see a really fragmented regulatory landscape. Um, without a doubt, Europe is a leader, um, both on and, and sustainable finance and, and a lot of the proposals that emerge on the sectoral level. But, and while a lot of these proposals kind of align in like 90%, there's a 10% that doesn't really align. And that 10% is going to drive a lot of cost, a lot of confusion and inefficiencies in the market. So, you know, zooming in on what I, is happening in Europe, and I should say that these are my you know, personal views based on experience, uh, not the views of all my member uh, states. You know, I think it's definitely timely 
and good that EU is taking this leadership role and to address the gaps that we're seeing and making a proposal on mandatory due diligence. Um, by making these historically voluntary standards mandatory, they're also gonna make them material. So there's all this question of materiality and I agree double materiality should be where it's at, but you know, regulators can make something material, commercially and financially material by legislating. And that is actually what's happening right now. Um, and that's a good thing. And I think if you look at the sort of three-legged stool emerging with Europe between corporate governance, non-financial reporting, and due diligence, I think that's the right kind of equilibrium. Um, although, you know, we would have some different reflections and comments on, on each of those. I won't go into the detail, but looking at due diligence specifically, I would also say I'm quite encouraged by what I see emerging, particularly from Parliament and the report of jury and the council and, and the continued remarks of uh, the Commissioner Reinders. Um, for us, a few things stand out as very important. One is the alignment with global standards of responsible business conduct. We see this as absolutely fundamental. Uh, as Ms. Haltala said, what Europe is a leader here and what you do here is gonna ripple across the world. But it's not a foregone conclusion that every jurisdiction is gonna automatically adopt the European standard. Um, you know, and therefore, by using global benchmarks that are agreed by other governments and supported by civil society and workers, we can help ensure that level playing field and that collaboration so that business spends their money on addressing risk to people and not on compliance processes in 12 different jurisdictions. And frankly, supply chains are global. And if we don't have this alignment, we're not going to create a regulation that works. All, that, frankly, that's the truth. Um, I like that I'm encouraged by the approach within that alignment of global standards of the whole value chain approach of integrating principles of risk-based due diligence, meaningful stakeholder engagement and transparency, because that's what makes due diligence effective are those, uh, those types of principles. I, I'm also encouraged by the understanding of liability emerging where there might be potential civil liability for harms that the businesses cause or contributes to and rather a more administrative penalties and fees for harms that are linked to the deep in the supply chain. I think that's an appropriate balance of reasonableness um, for business where they can have the certainty they need, but also people on the ground can have access to remedy when they're harms, uh, when they've been harmed. And critically, the point of complementary and accompanying measures is gonna be fundamental from our perspective. If we look at other jurisdictions where these types of laws have emerged, including in Europe and the conflict minerals regulation is really a model here in providing information on conflict zones and providing guidance and a recognition process for sort of industry or multi-stakeholder efforts. I think that is gonna be very, very fundamental. And I, and I think you know due diligence is not gonna be a silver bullet to address all the harms here and the accompanying measures, trade measures, public procurement measures, financing, uh, but also just risk information on country risk information uh, is going to be fundamental to delivering, I think, what this seeks to achieve. So happy to explore some of those issues further. That is my initial reactions, Alexandra. Thank you so much. That's excellent, Tyler. And indeed, you know, ha happy to discuss further. Uh, but for the time meaning, I'll, uh, let, let's pass on to Anselm. Anselm, would you like to share the French experience? Uh, I mean, in France, uh, you've had um, law uh, on due diligence already for quite some time. However, my understanding is that it's mostly about reporting, not necessarily so much about obliging companies to do it, or it's a little bit, you know, I would say, more in, less uh, explicit, let's put it this way. Uh, but at the same time, you know, like, uh, of course, if you'd like to share with us, uh, I would say your experience and um, views with regards to, you know, like uh, uh, the status of uh, um, company of with the mission, which I understand that you have been also very much involved in. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Alexandra, and uh, thank you very much for uh, Finance Watch to, to, to have me. So, as you pointed out, uh, Alexandra, I'd like to say a few words on the, on the, the experience of the French law, because we now have four years of hindsight, uh, given that the law uh, dates back to uh, 2017. And then I will tell you a few words on how it was implemented in practice, and finally, uh, a few takeaways that we might uh, take 
uh, for the, the, the upcoming uh, EU uh, directive. So a few words to start with on the French law. So uh, as you know, uh, the French law uh, set uh, re relatively, relatively uh, high thresholds, uh, namely that those thresholds of 5,000 employees are assessed on a, uh, on a consolidated level, meaning above the ordering company and its direct or indirect uh, French registered subsidiaries. So the threshold is set at 5,000 employees and you have an alternative uh, threshold of 10,000 employees uh, for uh, direct and uh, indirect uh, subsidiaries located, uh, registered uh, globally. So, um, and then uh, what this uh, law implies in practice is that uh, companies that meet this criteria are required to draft and implement uh, annual uh, due diligence uh, plans and this due diligence plan plans basically mostly um, uh, consist in identifying uh, risks and preventing serious violations with, risk, with respect to a number of rights, which are human rights, um, uh, fundamental freedoms, health and safety uh, of employees, and environmental uh, risks that result for uh, companies, subsidiary, sub supplier, and some sub subcontractor uh, activities. So what it's important to bear in mind is that these due diligence plans require a risk uh, map mapping exercise, which um, implies prior pri prioritary, sorry, prioritizing risks. This prioritization of risk is very important because companies have uh, limited resources and may not uh, level, uh, conduct the same level of due diligence on each single uh, subcontractor of the entire uh, value chain. So a few things to note about the French law, which as you said, uh, Alexandra is very short, it's not very prescriptive, meaning that it doesn't uh, provide a mandatory due diligence uh, standards, meaning that in practice, um, uh, companies may use uh, internal codes of conduct, OECD guidelines, ILO standards as mentioned by uh, Tyler, or any other uh, sectoral uh, charter. So what we see in practice is a great diversity when you look at the various uh, due diligence plans. And then another issue that is important is the, the depth uh, uh, within the value chain, which is to be covered by the, by the, by the due diligence. So French law does not ex exclude suppliers and subcontractors beyond the given, a given rank. Um, so French law does not state that mandatory due diligence should only focus on the first tier of a supply chain. However, it provides uh, the criterion of established commercial relationship, which is not um, uh, fully clear um, and, and, and evenly understood by uh, eligible companies. So in a few words, what lessons may be learned from this French experience? So first, this 2017 law was clearly a first. It was a pioneering law and it was beneficial in the sense that it forced companies to formalize uh, within these uh, due, due diligence plans um, practices, best practices already implemented by companies uh, uh, that were complying to corporate social, social responsibility uh, contractual uh, obligations. Uh, however, and that, that is, that is not something new, that's something um, uh, pointed out by an official report. It's, it's clear that, as you pointed out, uh, Alexandra, there is clearly a heterogeneous level of maturity uh, of companies in the implementation of a law. As I said, uh, implementation of a law uh, varies uh, from one company uh, to the next, depending on its field of activity. Uh, the concept of due diligence is not uh, interpreted in a very, uh, I would say, shared way by um, companies, and, and also there is a divergence of understanding between uh, stakeholders. So, uh, and when it comes to companies, they say that the, the law is very short and is not very explicit, and there should be a need for administrative guidance on how to interpret this law. So uh, to conclude the, uh, with uh, this French experience, a few takeaways that may be needed for the EU uh, upcoming uh, legislation. So takeaway number one is you need to have a large scope for due diligence. 
So French law not only covers human rights, but also environment. Uh, we have another law for ethics and for cross-sector uh, risk. So all these risks are significant, uh, may result in severe violation and could be uh, captured by the upcoming uh, directive. Another issue is involving uh, stakeholders and making sure the due diligence uh, plan is not drafted by, I would say, one person in charge by, by sharing collective approaches. So if you engage with stakeholders, notably work, working um, workers associations, sorry, but also on-site local uh, NGOs, this is key uh, to address systematic issues in global supply chain and will be uh, detrimental in make, making sure that the due diligence plans have an impact for the, for the better. Um, another uh, issue is uh, the threshold. So the thresholds in French law granted are relatively high. However, you can have a ripple effect or cascade effect because all the contractual uh, obligations uh, ripple down to the uh, subcontractors. Uh, and so the, 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 the law and the upcoming directive can have a positive impact. Um, penultimate issue is that of level playing field. Uh, mentioned by Ms. Uh, Hotala. So uh, we believe that the upcoming directive should not only um, uh, apply to uh, European companies, but also non-European companies that make a substantial proportion of a turnover uh, within uh, the EU. So we've been working on that and we are glad to see that this uh, level playing field, this application to non-EU companies was already uh, proposed in the, uh, in the proposal from the European uh, Parliament. And finally, and I and perfectly agree with uh, Tyler when it comes to enforcement. Uh, so in France, we have a very much court-based uh, enforcement system, which is based on the civil liability system. We think this civil liability is necessary. However, we believe that companies uh, need uh, administrative guidance uh, to make sure that all these concepts, you know, of established commercial relationship are understood in a more uh, homogeneous fashion. So we believe uh, creating uh, national administrative authorities on top of uh, the court uh, enforcement system uh, would be very uh, beneficial as well. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing these insights, uh, Anselm. That's very, very helpful. And I'll be certainly happy to come back to some of uh, actually the points you made. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to uh, hand over to Andrea. Uh, Andrea, would you like to share your experience? I mean, I understand you worked quite a lot uh, with uh, companies, but also with uh, investors, with, with governance. I mean, you have a very rich experience as an international lawyer specializing in those aspects. Uh, we are very keen to hear your experience and insights also. Thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you for uh, to Fine and Watts for the invitation and uh, to all these speakers for the very interesting and insightful uh, uh, interventions. Um, so I'd like to respond to your questions about where we are now, uh, what the state of play and where I see uh, one of the major challenges. And I think it is important to start by um, bearing in mind that policy and legal processes are complex, are long, um, that are taken step by step. And this one is, of course, uh, no exception. And I think the good news, at least for me, is that I think the basis for the adoption of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence have been uh, laid out. And in my view, precisely uh, what I mean, what we're doing already with, uh, in particular, financial institutions is working on integrating what um, we already see out there in the regulation and we already see out there an obligation for um, human rights and environmental due diligence. And this is something that is very much uh, concerning financial institutions at the moment and understanding uh, what is the, the scope and the extent of, of, of those obligations. So I wanna uh, make in particular uh, three points because I think it is important to understand that the adoption of, a, of a specific instrument of mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence should be also uh, understood in this larger context, you know, of, of other um, existing obligations. And okay, I, I wanna make then uh, three points on that. So the first one is to remind us of the notion of a smart, a smart mix that uh, John Rogge so cleverly articulated when developing the UN guiding principles. 
And this smart makes refers to the state duty to protect human rights. And um, that duty encompasses the need for states to have effective legislation and regulation to protect against um, human rights harms by businesses. And that involves national and international measures as well as voluntary and um, mandatory measures. And this is what we're seeing now at the EU and the national levels in Europe. And I think it is important to keep in mind that what we're seeing here is exactly the fulfillment of this state duty to protect human rights under the guiding principles, but also under international human rights law. And what would be key, as uh, Taylor mentioned at the end of, of his presentation, is the balance of all these different elements. So really, I think the question is how we, we, we make this mix already smart and smarter you know, in, in going forward. The second uh, point that I want to make is that the impetus on regulation is also responding to stakeholder expectations, including businesses and, and, and financial institutions. And here I think it's interesting to recall the results of the consultation on the sustainable corporate governance initiatives that were published in May. And in that chat consultation, 22% of participants were businesses and 20% were industry associations. And we should uh, remember that um, in that consultation, 82% of participants supported the development of legal, uh, uh, the legal framework on due diligence and were asked about the preferred design of that framework. The most ambitious design got 48% of the support. And we also seen, have seen letters of support from German and Dutch businesses. And I think very interestingly, again, last week, uh, we had a statement by 94 investors representing 6 trillion of asset under management, reaffirming the support for robust due diligence. And then the third point that I want to make that connects with the position of business and finance at the moment is really understanding that there are already legal requirements for them uh, uh, for, um, and for, sorry, for human rights and environmental due diligence in the context of the EU Green Deal. And let me explain this briefly. So first, in a narrow um, way, the, under the EU taxonomy, for companies and financial institutions claiming that their activities um, products and services are sustainable, uh, they have to demonstrate compliance with the minimum safeguards. And the taxonomy regulation is very clear saying that this compliance means alignment with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and the OECD guidelines. And the only way to be aligned with those instruments is really implementing human rights and environmental due diligence. Now, in a broader uh, scope, with a broader scope, the new regulations on reporting under sustainable the sustainable finance disclosure regulation and the upcoming corporate sustainability reporting directive also move us to this space, in particular with the notion of double materiality. Because if in addition to identifying how sustainability risk impact the performance of the economic activity, companies and financial institutions need to identify how the um, uh, activities, the product and services impact people and the environment, uh, we will uh, we will get actually that that the tool to do that is, is human rights due diligence. And if you look at the details of the regulation, we actually fall squarely on that requirement. If you look at the uh, sustainable finance disclosure regulation, it demands to disclose the policies for the identification and prioritization of the adverse sustainability impacts. To disclose those impacts and to disclose also the adherence to responsible business conduct codes and international standards for due diligence. And the corporate sustainability reporting directive is more explicit in that respect, asking the identification of those impacts and how the impacts were identified. And it goes to defining due diligence consistent with the guiding principles and the OECD guidelines, including key aspects as requiring this due diligence in the entire value chain and considering impacts by uh, business relationships, products and services. And I think this is important, in particular, we connected with this uh, need for enforcement and, and, and the enforcement um, uh, provisions that are in these regulations. And then I join um, the, the previous speakers, in particular, Commissioner uh, Reinder and, and Vice President Hautala, in the importance of the enforcement and of civil liability and this enforcement. But as um, Anselm reminded us also, and, and it was also mentioned by Taylor, the Effective accountability also includes the administrative supervisions of these uh, uh, corporate obligations. And it will be very interesting to see then how 
enforcement of these obligations under these reporting regulations and the taxonomy would be implemented by national authorities. Because there is a potential here for this regulation to play a very important part in the puzzle of uh, uh, accountability and filling an accountability gap that can occur between the scope of civil liability and the scope of the obligation of human rights and environmental due diligence. And uh, I mean, I will stop here and probably we can uh, explore more about this idea of the, account uh, uh, the accountability gap uh, in, in the further question. But I, what I want to say is that uh, the adoption of mandatory human rights due diligence in, a, in, a, in an instrument expressly is very important in order to uh, extend the scope of this obligation larger to uh, a, a, a broader uh, number of businesses, but also to be clear about the civil liability for human rights harm. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, actually, I, I think what, what, what here strikes me actually from our discussions that I think the word enforcement uh, came many times, and uh, I, I think in general, enforcement indeed is key to make actually rules effective. And, and I think this is also part of the problem that also in the EU, uh, we have so many rules, a lot of them very, very good, but the problem is that many of them are not sufficiently enforced. And I think very often there is even not enough verification to what extent they have been properly enforced. And then we have this kind of tendency when, when the businesses start complaining like, oh, there is new and new rules coming, you know, subsequent revisions, uh, which, which in a way actually are due to the fact that, you know, the rules uh, we currently have are not really delivering. But I think maybe part of the problem is that the rules we have are just not really properly enforced. So actually maybe pausing here for a while, I, I'd like to actually uh, maybe spur a little bit on a debate how how to how to ensure that we create an effective regulation you know I would say here driving generating positive impact and what should be the enforcement mechanism to make it effective do we need judicial enforcement with liability and compensation in case of harm caused by not fulfilling the due diligence obligations? Do we need supervision by uh, national competent authorities? And if yes, should it be based on complaints or should it be you know, a kind of a uh, random or regular check of whether companies are actually fulfilling their obligations? And in case if it's a supervision by national competent authorities, which actually authorities would be best placed to do it because you know in in especially for instance yeah it also depends on about what type of companies are we talking about are we talking about uh, listed companies i mean they're you know the financial services authorities but you know maybe they are not necessarily the best place maybe they don't have the resources and and i think here it would be very uh, interesting to hear from anselm uh, what, what is the solution you know currently used actually in france for that yes do we need a special authority for that do do we need it at European level or is it better, you know, close to the markets and companies at, at, at national level? And, um, and yeah, I, I don't know whether maybe this is also something we want to discuss later on and not immediately not to mix it up. But I think the topic of actually the liability, civil liability is also key. And here I'd like to ask whose liability should it be? Are we here talking about liability of directors? So linking a little bit to the discussion in the previous panel and to something which is very, very controversial. However, a very important decision actually a discussion uh, to have. Why? Because yeah, at the end of the day, I think the problem is that we're, we're humans. And I think unfortunately not everybody is very ethically driven. And very often when people are not really responsible or made responsible for something, they just don't really care. And I think with the last financial crisis, what we have seen that actually a lot of people who were taking decisions, they got away without actually any you know, pain for what they have done. Instead, they actually found other scapegoats or eventually maybe it was you know, the company's money you know, uh, that, that was so eventually maybe also shareholders money. But for instance, individual directors were not really held accountable. But yeah, maybe starting first with the enforcement. Um, so, yeah. Is, yep, Tyler? 
I'll take a first crack. I don't think I have, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing both Ansem and, and, and Madam Haltala's views on this because I think they have a, probably a better sense of the reg enforcement uh, ecosystem in Europe. But um, I would say a mix of both judicial and um, sort of supervisory, administrative supervisory is necessary. The judicial, for my view, should be limited to, like I said, harms that the business causes or contributes to so that where there's a sort of, let's say, a causal link um, between the actions of the business uh, for foreseeable harm without adequate safeguards. Um, so that will provide some opportunity for individuals in, in the courts to, to work some of this out uh, and to provide a remedy, which is critical. And administrative supervision should cover the wider ambit of due diligence failures. So I do want to say it's not civil liability for all due diligence failures. Again, civil liability when there's a harm that the business contributes to, but broader due diligence failures, including those linked deep in the supply chain subject to administrative supervision. I believe that this should be probably risk-based supervision. Um, and you know, this is not unknown, you know, anti-money laundering authorities, um, uh, offices that are looking and, and supervising for bribery are very used to risk-based supervision and what that looks like and how to do that. Um, so we're not talking about something completely new here with food safety, we, there, there's risk-based supervision. There's a lot of areas where there are supervisory authorities and risk-based means that they will take all kinds of information, including individual complaints, including monitoring and information from police or law enforcement authorities or monitoring reports and follow up. But here I wanna say that unfortunately a lot of work and sometimes even advocacy is on regulation. And then once the regulation is adopted, everyone's like, okay, we're done. And in fact, that's actually where the real work begins. And I would say law enforcement and supervisory authorities are often left out of these discussions and are not part of the sort of international discussions to how to like build their own capacity. So we have, for example, a network of law enforcement authorities on minerals related crimes and, and mineral supply chains. And what we've seen is really surprising that police and customs units and uh, all the tax authorities and anti-money laundering authorities who are all dealing with crimes and mineral supply chains are not talking to each other, are not well resourced. And, you know, and particularly for global crimes, which involve cooperation across jurisdictions, are not very well equipped to cooperate with their law enforcement counterparts to share information and to detect, investigate, and prosecute certain crimes. So, I mean, I think where we need to be working and focusing and, and really encourage advocacy efforts to support law enforcement and the supervisory authorities to make sure they're well resourced. On the question of director duties, I think I probably um, don't have an answer for that, but I'm looking forward to hearing the other views. Thank you so much, Tyler. Yes, Andrea. Thank you, Alexander. I mean, I totally agree with Taylor. I think that, I mean, you need both. You need uh, civil liability for the harms and then the administrative supervision. And I think it's interesting to uh, have in mind that there is a lot of work already done also in, 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 in these, and we should not forget the, the, the project of the Office of the High Commission on Human Rights and accessibility, on, on accountability and remedy. And there is a lot of advice there for states and about how to go and how to look at these issues. And there is also a recently document by the Office of the High Commissioner and shift regarding at the at administrative supervision and what would be the requirements of this supervision in order to be effective. And um, I mean, one of the biggest challenges in this area would be that of capacity building, which is going to read on, on, on the sense that Taylor was saying about not leaving these um, government officials uh, alone afterwards. And that would also go in the way of avoiding the enforcement being, and in particular administrative supervision being just um, a thick book exercise, right? So you need really um, uh, to staff those um, uh, uh, authorities that would be in charge of the uh, supervision with people who are uh, knowledgeable about the normative standards and what underlies the normative standards uh, in order to do a really qualitative assessment and not only a quantitative assessment uh, and, and kind of like very you know basic uh, issues about about uh, human rights or uh, I mean the environmental and human rights diligence uh, and there is also about the effectiveness of the sanctions in order to be dissuasive so it has to be also I think uh, consistent and, and very clear for, for, for companies what, what that entails and it goes again to this um, 
uh, element that was mentioned before about guidance, which is uh, also part of the smart mix uh, that I was referring before and that uh, also John Reggie had in mind when developing the guiding principles. It is not only the legislative uh, documents, it is also the guidance that can be provided and the clarity that can be provided. Um, so I think that, that we, we, we should consider this, this a challenge of capacity building for the administrative supervision. And in terms of the uh, liability question, we also need to look at a broader picture again and seeing again the smart mix. And I wanna call the attention here of a very interesting discussion that is happening right now today as we speak here, the International Law Commission, the, four, uh, the sixth committee is actually uh, looking at a resolution to start a convention on crimes against humanity that includes um, private actors, and that includes not only uh, uh, the individuals, but also the companies. Uh, and that that is another little piece, you know, we really need to see that this is, you know, this smart mix of this bustle that has many different uh, elements. And when we think about enforcement and accountability, we need to really take into consideration all those elements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, Ms. Hautala, would you like to react with your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I've been observing with great interest these um, uh, court cases that uh, seem to um, appear more and more often where actually companies are uh, made uh, accountable uh, and liable for uh, harms done. And there's, there's this quite groundbreaking one from the Netherlands, uh, I think from May, when 16,000 citizens challenged the Royal Dutch Shell. On, on climate emissions and, and sort of laggard climate policies. And uh, it's really interesting to, to find out that uh, in fact, uh, when the court ruled that uh, Royal Dutch Shell had not done enough to reduce their emission first uh, on in, in the whole of their value chain, also including their subsidiaries. So, and, um, and there was a direct reference to, to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. So we see that environment climate, um, uh, human rights are kind of uh, very often now interlinked in, 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 in myriads of ways. So this kind of accountability, I think, adds um, to um, the, the need to set some sort of minimum standards for civil liability. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's maybe a bit unfortunate that at the European level, I don't think there's really a, a possibility to, to revise the, the two conventions that are here relevant, the international private international law conventions. I think it's Brussels one and Rome two. So probably because um, to, to add something on, on corporate um, liability might lead to the opening of the Pandora's box and to, to also bring about many other needs uh, which um, everybody not may support. So uh, I think that at least some sort of uh, minimum standards for, for access to justice for victims at European Union member state level has to be put in place. and. Um, I would like to see that there would be a, a new European Union level authority um, to well to 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 see that there is an enforcement um, and 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 that companies uh, do uh, fulfill their duties um, and um, also I don't know if it can be in the same hands or if it should be the European Commission um, to to give guidance advisories to companies. Uh, we've seen this already, for instance. Um, I don't know, perhaps it's not even the first one, but um, uh, in July, under some pressure from the European Parliament and the civil society, uh, the Commission gave an, an advisory and guidelines to companies how to uh, identify and eradicate forced labour from their supply chains. And uh, there's been a very rapid evolution here uh, in um, not long ago uh, now. Um, the Commission's president has announced that there will be a legal instrument uh, to ban prohibit imports of products produced with forced labor, which I, I, I really I have a strong view that it needs to be a trade instrument. It's, this, is, this should not be mixed with the due diligence instrument, which is basically company law. So, um, so yes, there will be lots of levels at, at accountability and liability. And uh, I also I find it very interesting that um, shareholders and investors are now calling for, for accountability uh, from companies. And, and as uh, Thomas Friedman has said, that this is a kind of a version of democratic capitalism. I don't know if I like that kind of version of democratic capitalism, but anyway, it's a step towards sort of more, more transparency, more accountability to companies also from their owners. And these are great developments. 
Great, thank you. Uh, and, and, and indeed, actually, well, I, I think we see more and more actually, as uh, I would say, if you request from the investor side, uh, we, which I think is definitely very positive. And, and I think what helped is the fact that now they face their own obligations with uh, sustainability disclosures regulation. And basically, if they don't get this information uh, from companies, uh, they, they will be in difficulty to fulfill you know, their own duties. So yes, in a way, sometimes it, it shows this kind of a you know, trinkle effect in, in a way, how, how, how it works. And in, in case of indirect, uh, I would say maybe rules to some extent. However, I think you know, like uh, everyone, including businesses would, uh, yeah, I think enjoy also uh, more clarity. And I think investors would also appreciate that they don't necessarily have to chase, I think, companies for the information. Uh, but yes, uh, anyway, I'd like to pass on to uh, Anselm um, to share again, you know, um, the, the, the French experience. F f thank you, Alexandra. So uh, when it comes to uh, enforcement, we in France have two uh, systems. First is uh, enforcement, meaning, for instance, when uh, an NGO or any other um, uh, collective with uh, with um, with uh, a mandate to, to, to act uh, may uh, bring uh, to, to, to justice, for instance, if they find that, uh, you know, the due diligence plan is not uh, specific enough. So uh, that is a two-stage uh, escalation process. Uh, first, we see uh, um, uh, three month uh, official notice may uh, be uh, served on the company. And then once this uh, three month notice uh, period has elapsed, uh, the company, uh, uh, sorry, the, the engine O, for instance, may order an injunction to the, to the court. So that's uh, enforcement, uh, meaning that when a due diligence plan is not specific enough, irrespective, irrespective or not, if a damage has been committed. However, once, uh, uh, I mean, if, um, if the NGO uh, found the, uh, that the, the damage has been uh, committed, then there is a remediation uh, mechanism, meaning a traditional uh, civil uh, liability. So uh, what we see in France is that uh, court-based court uh, enforcement um, raises a number of uh, challenges because it is uh, it is uh, time uh, consuming. As I said, uh, the French law is not very specific. Uh, and plus, there is no, um, I mean, there is no definitive uh, case law uh, for the time being, uh, meaning that uh, companies uh, find that it, um, it, uh, it uh, creates some degrees of uncertainty for them. Um, so uh, we believe that uh, civil liability is important uh, to to hold uh, companies accountable. Uh, however, and on top of that, and as uh, mentioned by uh, by Tyler, with whom I completely agree, we also need to have administrative uh, supervision of um, of uh, due diligence plans. Uh, that is why we in France have um, have supported the idea of creating a national administrative supervision supervision authorities to so to answer your question uh, alexandra it would be more uh, at least for the time being located at a national uh, level and these authorities which uh, may also be uh, pre-existing authorities of course um, uh, should be in charge of uh, supervising um, uh, due diligence uh, plans great thank you and may i also ask the civil liability you were referring to is it civil liability vis-à-vis -vis the companies or directors? It is a civil liability vis-à-vis uh, -vis the, the company, the, the legal entity. And do you think it is sufficient? Do you think it's actually effective in itself? Or do you think it could be interesting? I mean, putting maybe for, the, for, for just two minutes aside all the practical political challenges with regards to achieving it. If we wanted to if we could do whatever we wanted and whatever we think that actually works best, do you think that actually making directors liable for that would be the best way to go? So I'm not the most qualified uh, person to, 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 to answer this, but um, I think this uh, raises uh, challenges in terms of intentionality, you know, that would be need to be demonstrated to make sure that the director on its own volition deliberately 
uh, omitted to uh, comply with the uh, with the law. Also, um, the direct I mean the, the board of directors is more seen in France as a collective uh, as a collective uh, as a collegiate body. So uh, I guess uh, French case law is more uh, reluctant to. Um, uh, you know, to um, to to imply the own uh, individual uh, liability of uh, of each single uh, uh, board member, and plus, it, 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 I mean, that's something to be de debated. But it also, I mean, we don't want to uh, deter, you know, board member candidates from uh, from um, being in this position. So it could raise it could raise uh, challenges. But I mean, that's something that could be uh, that would deserve to be uh, explored. Yeah, no, d definitely. And indeed, uh, you know, I, I agree that, you know, uh, we, we also, of course, if we were going to go down the route and if it was actually feasible to, you know, achieve something there, I, I think, of course, the rules would have to be very carefully balanced because, of course, we don't want to go, you know, to the addicts extreme. Of course, we don't want to end up in a situation where nobody wants to be a director. And, and of course, we, we, we don't want to, you know, uh, create, I would say, undue problems, you know, for, for the people in this kind of positions who may, as you said, you know, may not be personally, you know, responsible for everything. But I think it could be still interesting to, for instance, you know, ponder around, okay, is it possible then to link the civil liability maybe with the board as a collective body rather than the company? But anyway, I see that Tyler and Andrea would like to react to that. Well, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I don't, I think the challenges raised by Anselm are, are correct. Um, you know, we need also certainty uh, with it, with the law, but, um, you know, also want to point out what Andrea said, you know, under international criminal law, individual directors could potentially already be responsible for aiding and abetting international crimes. It just, the, the problem is that it's not very clear in various jurisdictions how that might be arise or that kind of crimes may be, uh, you know, prosecuted. Uh, there may not even be a legal basis in some jurisdictions. So, but I think there's already a framework there. To Andrea's point, you know, the ILC, what they're doing, the International Law Commission, could be very helpful in clarifying some of these things. And there's been a lot of good work already historically on clarifying corporate complicity, individual liability. And if you look back to the origins of some of this stuff in law and back to Nuremberg. I mean, there were there were companies, directors that were prosecuted in Nuremberg for for their complicity and very serious human rights uh, violations. So I think there's a framework there. I'm not sure the due diligence is the right way to push that framework. I think it's maybe a different way, uh, but there's already something that can be built on. I think I mean my my, my point goes to the to, to coordination and 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 I think I mean. Um, I agree with with Taylor. I mean, and, and generally about like looking at this broader picture and, and, and seeing the different elements that are already out there in terms of civil liability. Um, and yeah, to the world that has already been done extensively, including during the mind of John Brogy, looking at these concepts of contribution and abating and waiting. Uh, so 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 really, um, there is already quite a lot of, of, of things uh, that could be useful in this debate, but I agree that it shouldn't be necessarily in, a, in, the, in the, the law for, for human rights diligence. Now, the point that I wanted also to make in terms of coordination is, is also uh, with respect to the administrative supervision, because what is that that in practice would happen? So if you know there is this uh, new uh, regulatory uh, measure imposing a mandatory human rights due diligence that would have uh, uh, at the same time, um, some authority uh, looking at this, I mean, supervision authority looking at compliance with the law. And at the same time, you have on the other side, all of these reporting requirements and all of these, uh, you know, I mean, the, under the corporate sustainability um, um, a reporting directive and also under the sustainable finance uh, reporting uh, disclosure regulations, you have also there uh, enforcement and it is also given to national authorities that will be looking at the substance of, I mean, at, at this reporting and how this reporting in a way would match or not with, the, with, with what is happening in the company. So would those be in the same, I mean, given to the same authority? And that goes to your question, who should be the, the right authority doing that? And I think when when thinking about the structure, these, these is important to uh, take into consideration. And that is why I think that it is important to understand that already under these existing regulations and re new reporting um, obligations, uh, there is you know, this element of due diligence already out there and that needs to be coordinated with 
whatever is really done, you know, more substantially in a mandatory human rights uh, and environmental due diligence instrument. Thank you. I think Ms. Hautala wanted to comment as well. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, I have to agree with, uh, with Tyler and um, Andrea that um, this framework is probably not the place to, 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 this, to, to, to put the, the criminal uh, liability in. But I also agree that in the most severe uh, breaches of human rights, uh, it is about crime indeed. And so there, there, are, there are frameworks that people as persons, as directors must be accountable. So uh, we, we can all imagine what those could be. Um, but I, are we coming to the end of our of time now, or do we still have a few minutes? Because I wanted to make a point which I think Tyler touched particularly. You're mute. Alexandra, you're muted. Alexandra, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Before, yeah, I was... if, if I can intervene here, as I've been put in charge of, 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 of you know, drawing the conclusion, five minutes will be enough for me. So in my view, you have more time. And if you give me between three and five minutes max to conclude, it will be sufficient. Now I disappear again. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's indeed what I was uh, asking. So please, please go ahead. Can I, can I, I wanted to make a point. Yes. I also need yes, to go. Through. Yeah, so I, I come back to these accompanying measures. Why? Because um, this is not just about cleansing our supply chains, our conscience, you know, to make us feel good. There's enough of that. But we need to make sure that the, the, the real conditions and the, in, in the producing countries also improve, that people's lives improve, the workers, uh, indigenous peoples, human rights defenders, everybody. And that's why I think um, uh, this uh, groundbreaking legislation, which the EU is now busy with, uh, unfortunately comes a bit of a surprise to the producer countries, I'm, because I'm dealing with the GSP uh, regulation. So I, I meet people from Pakistan, from Uzbekistan, from Ghana, from, uh, you know, all countries. And I realized that uh, these, these countries are not perhaps very ready for what we are planning. So we, we have a very strong need to, to put the whole toolbox of the EU into use. And that means development cooperation. It means uh, how, to, how to get the kids uh, away from the cocoa plantations in Ghana. The only way is that we help to get the kids to school, otherwise this will not happen. And I think many companies also feel that they cannot do this job alone. So uh, I, I would call for a kind of a whole of government approach at the EU level for to, how to implement all this in practice. I'm afraid I have to leave, so I'm very grateful for Finance Watch and, and everybody because all these discussions are learning opportunities and, and you know, so thank you very much. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for your time and participation and uh, extremely useful uh, ideas that you shared with us. It is true that I was very tempted to ask one last question, but uh, I, I'm not sure you still have um, uh, time for that, but basically about proportionality and whether to actually, you know, like how to on one hand side ensure proportionality, but at the same time to ensure that we have uh, the, the, the law that will actually, you know, uh, properly work, and um, and 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 basically, you know, like if we, for instance, exclude SMEs, wh whether uh, any law on due diligence will actually be effective. I mean, because at the end of the day, yes, if we talk about the supply chains, right? Uh, the the thing is that the larger companies they will also need to get the information, you know, from their suppliers in many cases SMEs. However, of course, somebody could also say like, yes, we could also leave it to the market forces in, in a sense that yes, then it will be the, the duty of the larger companies asking smaller companies for that information. But yeah, I, th I think there can be pros and cons, you know, to all of these approaches. But yeah, I'd be happy to hear your views on that. Uh, Alexandra, I can comment. Uh, I can briefly uh, comment on that. So, um, uh, 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 so two things. Uh, first, as I mentioned, uh, French law uh, requires uh, risk mapping, and and French law uh, further states that risk risk mapping um, um, implies risk uh, prior prioritization. So, that what does this prioritization mean in practice? It's very uh, important. It means that you cannot. Uh, due to your limited resources uh, for a company, possibly uh, conduct the same uh, level of thoroughness in terms of due diligence on each 
a subcontractor. So, for instance, when a company makes a ma maps its own risks, it should identify uh, suppliers or subcontractors that, for instance, are located in a given uh, geographic region with um, risk of, uh, I mean, uh, severe risk of uh, violations, and then should uh, adapt or adjust its uh, due diligence uh, measures uh, for, uh, I mean, depending on this prioritization of uh, risk for uh, contractors. For So, for instance, conducting on-site inspections or working with uh, on-site on NGOs on, uh, I would say, sensitive uh, suppliers, but then, but then for lesser uh, sensitive uh, suppliers, um, uh, document-based uh, audit uh, may be uh, sufficient. And then the other uh, point that I wanted to make uh, regarding proportionality is that even in, like in France, as I said, we have relatively um, high uh, threshold for ordering uh, companies. It still has some ripple or cascade effects on uh, subcontractors because uh, contractual audit clauses, for instance, are replicated uh, down, the, um, uh, down the supply chain. So my point that uh, uh, you have the issue of, uh, of the thresholds for ordering companies, but it can still have some uh, impact, positive impact along the, the value chain for uh, uh, SMEs, even if they are not captured as, uh, in their capacity as ordering companies. That's very um, interesting. Thank you. Um, Tyler, uh, Andrea, would you like to uh, respond to that as well? Um, yeah, well, I think, it, it, you know, on the, the question of how to treat SMEs, I mean, on the one hand, SMEs make up almost, at least in OECD countries, 90% of the of the corporate corporatized entities worldwide, probably, um, you know, and roughly 80% of employment. Um, they are hugely exposed in many cases to global value chains as well. Um, and in some cases also high risk themselves if they're in specific sectors. Um, so it is a challenge. I mean, on the one hand, we need SMEs to be able to, to avoid too much red tape and to grow, uh, but we also need them to observe international standards. Now, what we have seen in other areas like environmental requirements is that sometimes automatically excluding SMEs from a regulation can actually hamper or restrict their development. You know, SMEs need to get access to finance. They need to integrate into value chains and have access to consumer markets. Um, sometimes regulatory requirements on environmental and social issues actually help them to do that because these are becoming, as Andrea so well put it, requirements of the financial market. So if, if, if SMEs want to get access to finance and grow, they may need to meet these standards anyway. And, and often it might be better for them to be part of a regulation where those standards are prescribed clearly rather than imposed by a client or a counterparty in a way that might be maybe undue. Um, that's not to say that there shouldn't be phase in periods uh, for SMEs, um, perhaps proportional uh, obligations that recognize more limited resources uh, of SMEs, uh, but SMEs, Large companies and small companies both face challenges doing due diligence. They're just different kinds of challenges that they face. Um, so, I mean, they should all be part of the puzzle. I mean, the complementary measure part has to be accompanied if you're including SMEs particularly, and that includes financial incentives. Um, and long, like I said, the, the regulatory design of phase and period. And if that's not feasible to really implement meaningful complementary measures, then probably SME should be excluded. But if it is feasible, I would say there's a lot of arguments as long as they're designed appropriately to include them so that SMEs themselves can grow and integrate into value chains. Right, thank you so much. If I may briefly just uh, uh, answer to this and, and also make a, a quick point about what um, uh, Ms. Otala said, because it is really, uh, thinking about those that um, would be the beneficiaries at the end of all this work, right? And although we said, you know, there is all of this infrastructure, even at international level for criminal liability, then we have access, you know, or, or elements for civil liability and administrative supervision. What we need to ask if realistically that 
person that is going to be impacted, you know, by a violation somewhere in, I don't know, the forest or the jungle in the Amazonia and in Colombia or Brazil would be able to really read that and access that effectively as, you know, as remedy. So how do we facilitate that access and uh, to, to, to people is, is, is really the, a key question. Um, and just uh, on, on the SMEs very briefly, I agree, I mean, with what has been said, and I, I think that if you, you take the guiding principles, it was never the intention to exclude companies, it was always the intention to cover everyone, so I don't think that the question is, is exclusion, but it's about better how it is um, made it more flexible, and in particular here on SMEs, I think two key questions is support and a specific guidance for SMEs, because most of the guidance is really now based on, on the experience of the larger corporations and also incentives, positive incentives from the market, but also from governments, for, for example, in procurement, or we could be even more creative about, I don't know, tax incentives or something like that. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you so much, Andrea. With this, uh, I think even if we could continue discussing, I think for a yet another hour, unfortunately, uh, the time has uh, really passed very quickly. And uh, well, I would like to once again, thank you so much for making yourself available and sharing your very valuable insights and experiences. This debate shows how complex this matter is and that there is no silver bullet. However, I think I could conclude that we agree that voluntary initiatives fall short and that disclosure requirements alone will not work unless underpinned by clear obligations for companies to perform due diligence through value chain. Uh, but of course, there needs to be a smart mix of the regulatory uh, measures. With this, I'd like to uh, hand over to Thierry Filippona for closing remarks. Thank you.